الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين We're continuing our third discussion about understanding Islam We previously mentioned the ayah that constitutes a final declaration of the completeness of Islam. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. This day I have completed your faith, your religion, your guidance, your way of life for you. And I have perfected your religion and my bounties upon you. And I am pleased to have you take Islam for your religion and to give you Islam as your religion. This ayah concluded the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to follow, to understand and to follow. And the word complete, akmaltu, it means there is nothing missing in our religion. There is nothing outside the Quran that is missing from the Quran that needed to be in the Quran to complete the Quran. The Quran is complete. The Quran is, however, accompanied with the operations manual, if you will. The sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the traditions he left us. And as he left us with this tradition and with the Quran, he tells us, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا فَلَنْ تَضِلُّوا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي عَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ Meaning, I have left you with both the Qur'an and my sunnah, my way, the way I applied Islam, the way I left you with the detailed explanation and guidance you need so that you will apply the Qur'an rightly in your life. So he says, I left you with the book, the Qur'an, and the sunnah, guidance that if you follow you would never get lost. Do you see that our Ummah has gotten lost? We are running, trying to trace our tail in the wilderness of the jungle of this life. And then when we get lost, we turn around to see our tail from the other side. This loss is not because of the guidance of Allah. But unfortunately, some Muslims look at what other communities and nations have achieved materialistically, and they look at themselves and they think that it is because of Islam that we are backward and lost and losing. But it is because of our neglection, neglect of Islam, that we are lost. It is like a traveler in a journey. 
he asks for guidance. And when you give him the guidance, he throws it in the garbage and he keeps driving. And when he discovers that he is lost, he looks for the guidance everywhere but where it was last in his hand. So he doesn't even find the guidance he was looking for. So he keeps getting lost, keeps taking the wrong exit, the wrong turns, the wrong U-turns, and keeps coming back to the same point and discovering that he's lost. So he keeps saying, I'm lost. We as an Ummah are doing exactly that. We know that we don't know where we are, but we think we do. We claim that we are Muslims, and because of that claim, we think since we are Muslims, we understand Islam, which we don't. And we think we know our way, but on the other hand, we forget it is we who just said we are losing and we are lost. Somebody has to call us up to wake us up. We need a wake-up call. Do you know when Allah wants to wake up a nation? It can be called to its own destruction. It can be called to its own demise. And it can be called to awaken from its sleep, deep sleep, deep long sleep, at a very high price. So Allah sends us signals, alarms, so that we can pay attention, in forms of a lot of things. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that unless you enjoy the good and forbid the evil, Allah will send enemies against you. Not only that, but send his torment upon you. And people who are sent against us are not going to show any mercy whatsoever. So we turn and seek relief and seek help from right and left, east and west. But we never look up because we know we have not made the cut. We have not reached the point of not only understanding Islam, but applying some of it into our life. We develop the culture of accepting from Islam what is convenient, what is easy, what is pleasant, what is on our side, what gives us what we expect and want and need, but not what charges us with any responsibility, light or heavy. We don't want to be obliging to Allah. And obliging to Allah is exactly what Islam is about, to submit to Him in matters you like and in matters you don't in matters that you see difficult, and in matters that you think are desirable, easy, and pleasant. Which requires that we adjust our desires to fit it into Allah's expectations. Instead, we want to retrofit Islam to our desires. You know what retrofitting is? Anybody is an engineer here? Retrofitting is when you get something that is not cut for something and you want to fit it in it. Like a truck's engine, you want to use it for a car. It's a truck engine. You cannot retrofit it in a car. You cannot cut parts of it to make it a car engine, but we're trying, we're trying. Islam, which is submission to Allah, is not going to be subject 
to our whims and desires. It's always going to be the word of Allah, take it or leave it. There is no third option. Allah asks us in the Quran, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Are you going to submit? Are you going to accept Allah? He tells us, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينًا مِمَّنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ Who is better than the one who submits his face, his direction, his ways, his heart, his everything to Allah? In the state of Islam, وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ Doing the best he can. We want the highest place in paradise for the least level of commitment to Allah. It's not going to happen. You know, we blame our enemies a lot, and they are to be blamed for many things. But before we look out, Allah tells us, your condition is in your hands. Whether it is your family condition, your personal condition, or your community or your nation, it is all in your hand. You shape it and take it where you want, but bear the consequences. إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Allah would not change the condition of a community or a nation or a family until and unless they change what's in themselves, not what is in their enemies. You don't control your enemies, but if you don't want to control even yourself, then you're losing everything. So as an ummah, we are exactly like a tree leaf. It left the branch and it is being swept right and left in the air. And the wind is throwing it in every direction. And of course, definitely a tree leaf falling from the tree is both powerless and dying. Why do we like the spirit of self-helplessness, self-imposed vulnerabilities that we put on ourselves? Because it gives us a story. We can sit, talk, chat, lick our lips and complain against how others are evil and bad and hate us exactly like they are doing. They also are saying that you are bad and you are evil and you hate them. It doesn't help either side. The only way it helps is pick up the pieces, collect yourself, put your house in order and once and for all submit to Allah. We've submitted to all earthly powers and we lost because they are not interested in poor, weak followers who have no commitment, who have no dignity, who have no anchors in their life, who have no power. It is exactly because this earth's rule is that might is right. But in Allah's view, right is might. If you have the truth, you should give it the power to protect it. So part of your truth is to be true to your truth. Then truth will get the power, the power of your commitment, the power of your discipline, the power of your resources, and the power of your unity, the power of your knowledge, then Allah will supplement all of these powers which are limited. In contrast to the power of Allah, He will supplement what you could gather of power with His own power. So He tells us, 
مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ And prepare for your enemy the power that you can so that you deter their desire and appetite for aggression. So when we lose our commitment, lose our understanding, and then do not do anything to develop any power, not the power of faith, not the power of unity, not the power of development, not the power of technology, not the power of advancing our life materialistically, we become like that tree leaf. We have no power. Whom should we blame? We should look ourselves in the mirror. It doesn't help much to continue to speak as victims when we know we are only victims because of our own making. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that whatever befalls you of whatever is good, it is from Allah. Whatever befalls you of calamities or injury, it is because of what your hands have earned. He doesn't wrong anyone. He would not deliver you to your enemies when you are committed to him. Allah, the merciful one, how could you commit to Allah and then he would leave you alone to be eaten in a jungle of enemies? It doesn't befit his majesty. It doesn't befit his wisdom. It doesn't befit his mercy. So we cannot continue to blame the enemies, especially the enemies outside our own community, our own nations, our own governments. Those are subject to our enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. They are supposed to be subject to your guidance and to your pushing against their evil desires and their excessive desires, desires for wealth, for control, for power, for which they are willing to use the most wicked and corrupt of ways. And then we complain, our governments are corrupt. All governments in the world have a degree or another of corruption. Power teaches corruption unless it's rooted in your submission to Allah. Then you know that his power is over and above yours. So you don't get arrogant with your material power. But when your power is a power of greed, a power of position, the power of controlling and manipulating and subjugating others, then this power is bound to lead you to arrogance and oppression of others. But that's not where we are even. We are, in effect, oppressing ourselves much more than any enemy could do to us by not applying Islam, by not learning Islam, by not giving Allah the time to hear him out and listen to his words and respect what he is telling us. Allah doesn't need us, we need him. Do we understand? Allah gave us the whole message, not just part of it. So you need not to search for any source to complete the guidance of Allah, which is already declared in your book as complete. It's finished. It's finished. But still, some Muslims like it their way, not Allah's way. And they claim to be Muslims. In fact, they claim to understand Islam better than 1400 years of scholarship. 
So they bring us tainted, polluted knowledge that they claim to be also Islam, which you know it is not. But we hear their voices and we get attracted by their logic and we get deceived by their ways because they may be speaking eloquently or convincingly by their false logic because our heads are empty from true logic. Our hearts are devoid of truth and commitment to truth. So anything goes. We become like an empty vessel. It's ready to carry anything. Anybody can put anything in it, it gets filled up. So Victor Hugo speaks, we listen. Bertrand Russell speaks, we listen. Uh, Hemingway writes, we listen. Anybody writing anything, we are willing to listen and follow. And when Allah speaks, we have questions. When the Prophet ﷺ speaks, we have issues. We don't understand. It is too old, subhanAllah. This is not our enemies telling us. This is some Muslims who are put on the pedestal of fame and celebrity as Professor X and Y and journalist ABC. All of these titles are meaningless unless the person is rooted in submission, both in faith and in commitment. We need to go back to the sources and to go back to Allah, not to correct his book, not to complete what he has sent down, but to submit to it, to let it tell us how we should live. Not for us to tell Allah how he should have said something different than what he already done. So brothers and sisters, we are having a big problem. We do have a big problem. We have some writings from some scholars, and I'm talking about Muslim scholars, who are expending their life trying to see how to fit Islam in what they call contemporary life. How to make Islam palatable, fit in the American system or the Russian system or the European system or the African culture system or the Arab culture or Indian culture. We want Islam to be retrofitted as we wish, to be custom tailored as we wish. And we label this as making Islam speak the contemporary language. The word of Allah has part of his attributes. It has the attribute of knowledge. In it is the attribute of wisdom. In it is the attribute of the infinite, the one who has no beginning, no end. His words were not meant for the people in the desert. 1435, 36 years ago. No. His words tell us that they were meant and are meant for people everywhere, every time, every year, every generation, in every corner of the earth. It was not meant for the generation of Muhammad وسلم, Just for them, no. It is not meant just for the Arabs. No. It is not meant for just the Indian subcontinent. No. It is not limited by where the footsteps of Muslims had reached in the first two, three centuries or five. It is meant for anyone who reads the book and it ignites and keeps reigniting the flame of faith and love of Allah in their heart.
This is what this book is for. It is not meant for imposition, that you impose it on people who don't believe in it. It is not meant for people who deny it. They have the right to deny it. But if you claim you believe in it, you better live it. You better live your book and your guidance and your faith. Otherwise, you are only as acceptable to your environment as your book is. That statement assumes that we are applying the book. But if we don't apply the book, then we have no value. We have no value. There is nothing in this life that doesn't grow rooted somewhere. Buildings, it has anchors. Trees, they have roots. The earth as a whole is anchored in it is attachment to an orbit. And it runs in that orbit constantly. So we are the only creation that is loosely connected until we tie that connection firmly. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, hold on to the robe of Allah, all of you all together. واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا It is also he who told us إن الإنسان لفي خسر Man is running towards nothing but loss إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات Except for those who believed and did righteous deeds so you claim to believe, you don't study, you don't know what you believe in. You claim to believe and you study and you don't understand, you wouldn't know how to apply it. You claim to believe and you actually understand what the belief is, but you don't want to commit. This what distinguished the early idol worshipper communities of the time of the Prophet. They understood Islam and they know what it meant, but they didn't want to submit. They denied it, but it has been settled as the truth in their souls. It is engraved in their heart from the beginning and even before their creation. But they deny it. Why? Zulman wa uluwa. It is self wrongdoing and arrogance. They didn't want to submit. They didn't want to be seen as weakened. The uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his uncle Abu Talib, who gave him the maximum earthly protection anybody had during his life, when offered the chance to declare his Islam at the time he was on his deathbed, do you know why he refused? He speaks and he says, I don't want to Quraysh to say Abu Talib weakened when he faced his death. Could this be a reason to doom yourself? What people say? But why blame him? We spend a lot of time in our life calculating what people may or may not say about what we say and what we do. So what's the difference? So he understood Islam, that Islam will move him from the head of his tribe, the leader in a community, to become a follower of Muhammad, his nephew, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He doesn't want his people to see him smaller than his size. 
Does what people say about us matter that much that we are willing to doom ourselves to please people? Believe it or not, we are doing this even after we became Muslims. We are calculating how people think about us more than we are calculating what Allah thinks of us. Where do we fit in Allah's balance and scale? How does he value us? Brothers and sisters, Allah values us as much as we value his word. The only way to value his word is to listen to his word, study his word, understand his word, and apply his word. The only way we can prove our love of Allah is to follow the Prophet ﷺ. So we need to ask ourselves that serious question. Do we really truly believe Allah? Or do we just believe in Allah? Do we just believe in his existence? Do we just believe in his holy names? That he is good, he is God? Do we just believe in that? Or do we also believe him? Believe his word? If Allah said the truth, and I claim to believe in that truth, shouldn't I follow it if it is true? When you get lost in the road, and you have an option to ask a local police officer for direction or another stranger, whom would you pick to give you guidance? The one who knows or the one that you pick because of other reasons? If you trust that a policeman knows the direction, at least where he serves, you would ask him and trust him and follow the direction he gives you. But if you follow and ask any other person who may or may not give you the best direction and you get lost, don't blame the person answering you, but definitely don't blame the police officer you never checked with. This is not comparison, but this is an illustration. We use our best wisdom in life situations, in material life, but when it comes to our spiritual life, we think we know exactly the thing that Allah says you know nothing about. We think we know our spirit. And Allah says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّ وَمَا أُوْتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They ask you about the spirit, tell them the spirit is a matter that is exclusively Allah's issue, not ours. He created it, He controls it, it is not under our control, but it is under our care. We have to care for it, we have to feed it, we have to nurture it, we have to develop our faith and strengthen our conscience so that we live a decent, productive life, a happy life, as individuals, as family, as community, as society, as a nation. Brothers and sisters, think about it. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? If you have one thing to invest, in the rest of your life that you think will take you to paradise, what this one thing be? What would it be? Working for whom? If you have one job that you think will get you to paradise, what this one job be? It is your submission to Allah which can never be true or complete without the knowledge of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the knowledge of Islam, the commitment to Islam, and the discipline in Islam.
الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم بفضلك يا أرحم الراحمين Brothers and sisters The subject of understanding Islam or misunderstanding Islam is key to our salvation. Our fate is hinged upon it. Our relationship with Allah is hinged upon it. Our dignity and existence in this life is hinged upon it. If we want to live as Muslims, there is a way. But if our desire and direction is somewhere else, Allah can easily and would easily replace us. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبِدِ الْقَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ We are the only losers in this process if we choose deliberately not to learn our deen or not to submit to Allah and give Allah our love of commitment and the discipline in practicing our deen. We cannot invite others to a broken house, however. We cannot blame others for a house that we have broken with our own hands. We have to put our house of faith in order before we look outside either for support or for enemies to blame. We have to take responsibility. We do this in every sphere of our life when we want to correct our way. When we want to make money, we do everything in our power to know the best ways of making money in our field. We need to also learn the best way to secure our fate in the hereafter. I have an announcement that I believe very central and very important for our community. We have partnered with public service health professionals and Fairfax County and other churches to provide health care services for the uninsured. How many of us here are uninsured? Can I see a show of hands? No, no, no. Raise your hand and keep it, please. How many? So we have quite a few. We have quite a few people and others who have not raised their hands because they are shy to say, I don't have insurance. Well, I know you don't. <laughs> so today we are inviting all Muslim healthcare professionals, whether it is physical health or mental health or any other health field services to come and join a meeting here at Dar al Hijra. Let me see if it is here. Yes, at Dar al Hijra. And this will be October 29th at 6 30 p.m., which is after Maghrib prayer. October 29th. So if you are a doctor, if you are a nurse, if you are in any medical or healthcare specialty, we need you to partner with other faith communities, healthcare professionals, doctors with doctors. Uh, the, this program will cover the insurance service wherever you are assigned to serve those communities so that people in every faith community can sign up to this program. Their information will be verified and they will be offered this service for free or for a very, very small fee. I think it's worth it. And I hope that if there is any healthcare professional here or any healthcare professional that is not here that you know, talk to them to commit. We need everybody. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to be in the service of his creation. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa afina fi man afayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك 
ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين My dear brothers and sisters I am reminded of this upcoming this Sunday Sunday the 26th we are having a fundraising on the issue of civil rights and civil liberties 19 organizations have come together to form the national coalition to, coalition to protect civil freedoms and that's particularly relevant to us Muslims in this country uh, we have not sold enough tickets yet so I urge you to please buy your tickets at the office it is $30 and I urge everyone who purchased the ticket to come. Come and ask this coalition, what do they offer? Brochures are available in the office with the tickets. Please purchase your ticket today before you go home. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to conclude our life with the prophets, with the righteous, with the martyrs and to give us the highest place in paradise and to give us the solid commitment and the solid discipline in our deen. Aqim as-salah. <laughs>